this is Grady. As you can see, he does not like being held. You want to see the camera for a second? Okay. All right. This is Grady. Hello, Grady. Let's see, he does not like being held just yet. All right, I'll let you go down. Go on back. There you go. There you go, buddy. Put you back in your little box. Or you don't even want to be in the box now. Okay. Come on the stand. He's very indignant about being picked up. He doesn't want to be picked up just yet, so. Oh, you've had him for less than a week. Well, I'm sorry. I wanted to show you the internet, dude. He's sitting over there and howling at me. You're what okay. Kind of, what kind of cat is he? He is a flame point ragdoll. And he is I still... I have never heard of that breed before. You never heard of ragdolls? No. Nope. Just over here. I'm familiar with Persians, I'm familiar with Siamese, I'm familiar with sort of, uh, well, Calicos, of course, uh, and I'm familiar with sort of the Mongol mixed cats that you find all over the place. Well, they're, they're kind of a, they're supposed to be a more docile and chill breed. He kind of is. He hasn't, he hasn't bitten or scratched or, he's hissed a little bit. He does, he's still leery of me and whatnot, but we're getting there. He's, he's, we, we started coming a little bit closer and, but he you still provide, does, you provide food, he'll eventually get used to you. Yeah, he still does not want to be picked up yet. So, but anyway, there's a reason I'm bringing this up. I have a whole lot of tech and I'm a brand new cat owner. Now, this can be the other way around for a lot of you. You're a cat owner and you get technology, especially in regards to computers. Now, cat hair everywhere. Oh yeah, we I've got a list we're going to go through tonight. There are there are some aspects of owning a cat that you don't immediately take into account when it comes to your computers and your tech. Specifically, and we'll start with that one. Hair. I I know you guys understand that cats shed and they shed on clothes and whatnot. Nash has long hair. He also sheds. Yeah. But um yeah, I used to have three-foot hair. We find it all over the place. That hair that cats shed does not just get stuck on carpets or on clothing. Clothing. It gets in the air as well. And what computers, modern computers, need in order to function is an air cooling system, which means it sucks in all the air. And when it sucks in all the air, it sucks in all the little cat. pieces of cat. Yes. This is a huge ass problem at some point because if your vent, we'll start with the desktop side of things. If the vents on your desktop's fan system get clogged, your computer's not going to be cooling as efficiently, it can potentially overheat, it can cause you other problems. It's a pain. Um, now there is a simple little thing you can get that will help with this. I'm gonna recommend this to you right now. Um, this is for most standard desktop systems. This is a little is a magnetic dust filter. I thought you were going to recommend. Um, what this little doohickey does is it's a little screen. Apparently, someone in the channel doesn't like the pieces of cat phrasing. It's pieces of cat hair, not pieces of cat. Well, technically, it's pieces of cat. Sure. You want to come back over? No, you're still pissed at me. Okay, he's still pissed at me. Um, now, it technically is a piece of cat, because if you get a few of them, and you take them and do some science on them, you can make a new cat. So it's technically pieces of cat. Um, this is a magnetic filter. It comes in various sizes and shapes, normally round or square. Now, of sizes, generally speaking, if, that's what, if I'm thinking what Nash is thinking of, uh, to fit over fan intakes. Right. So you'll find 12 centimeter, 14 centimeter, maybe 20 centimeter, but that's... Yeah. What these do, you take one of these, you slap them on the side of your case over the fan hole. Now, it is going to impede your airflow slightly. It's a screen and it does go over the fan, but it'll impede it a lot less and be a lot less of a headache than a mat of cat hair on the side of your computer. The nice part about that, this, this little thing is it's magnetic, there's no screws to attach to it, and you can easily take it off your computer, take it to the bathroom, rinse out all the cat hair, dry it off, and put it right back on your computer. 
So it's very convenient. It's very useful and it helps you from having it. will also catch regular dust as well. Yeah. So it'll have less dust build up inside your computer as well. Yeah. Now, you are going to have to be aware if you don't get one of these things, and maybe even if you do, if you get cat bit hair buildup inside your system, you're going to need a can of compressed air. You're going to have to keep one handy. Now, this is good advice even if you don't have a can, but cleaning the, uh, the, the dust and gunk out of your system. If you don't have a can, you should probably do it once a month. If you do have a cat, you might want to do it once a week. Um, it's it's one of those things that will help your computer not. And that gunk and stuff can cause other problems. In fact, if fans get gunked up quite enough, they'll die. And if those fans yeah. die, you have to replace them. And some of them, especially like on video cards, are proprietary. So replacing fans on video cards can get really expensive. This is one of those things that can help protect your system. Laptops are a different issue. These, there are no real easy screens to put on them, and taking them apart to clean them is a chore. It really, really, it, it can be a huge chore. So my best advice to you, if you have a cat and a laptop, and you'll notice when you have a cat, your laptop is its best friend, especially when you're using it. Because it's warm and it's in your face. And you're paying attention to it and not them. So what you, you're going to want to do is you're going to want to use the canned air on that as well. You'll notice there's some air intake fans uh, or uh, vents on the bottom of your computer, typically sometimes on the back, but uh, somewhere on the back or the bottom. And there's a normally the the place where the hot air comes out is on the side. Also could be on the back. Those are never on the bottom. What you want to do is find the ones on the bottom and just blow through some of that compressed air. Now, you're not going to get as effective a cleaning. Pro try and do this once a week on your laptop. Now, you can say to me, well, that's just too much trouble. And I'll say right back to you, well, if you want to own a cat and a computer, you're going to want to do it once a week or you won't have that computer for long. Yeah, there's some great pictures out there about people who didn't clean out their computers very often. Yeah, cats, especially with laptops, it, it's not. It's a little bit of an issue with desktops. It's a much bigger one with laptops because that little fan is not near as powerful as what's on your desktop system. So it has to go work a whole lot harder. It's blowing a whole lot more, and it's sucking in a whole lot more cat hair. And in doing so, it's easier to clog up. And once that clogs up, your processor overheats, start, stuff stops working very well, you get all confused, you take it to the computer place, you spend $200 for them to diagnose it, and they tell you, why weren't you cleaning this out with compressed air? Now it's dead. Get a new one. By the way, that's $200 in labor. Now, one thing you can do with your cat to help alleviate this problem is brush them regularly. Yes, groom your cat. That will help reduce the, just get, uh, I got this neat little nifty little device I picked up on Amazon. This is a cat brush, nice little steel bristles, and you push this button, boom, all the cat hair comes right off, just, just wipes right off there, and you can clean it, and boom, there you're back in business again. This will also have the advantage of your cat hocking up less hairballs. Yeah. So less vomiting, that's also a good thing. Yay. Um, uh, the next thing you need to consider, especially if you work with your computers, if you repair computers, if you build computers, cats are little walking Van de Graaff generators. Especially in dry areas. Yes. This little bastard, and I, I'm calling him a little bastard, he's not, he's a sweetheart, but... Every time I've been petting him, I'm in the Midwest, it's dry and cool here, and every time I've been touching him today, it's been zap, 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 because he's little medium hair and he generates electricity. This is very, very bad for computers because computers do not like static electricity to the point of if you introduce a static shock to the wrong component in your system, you have killed your system. 
Yeah, now your keyboard and mouse won't generally care about this. No. And if you've got a tower case and you brush the case and it shocks the case, the case is generally grounded, grounded. well enough that you're not going to have an issue. It's when you're going in there to work on things that's the problem. Yeah, and as much as the cat may not like it, you are going to, when you work on a computer, it is recommended you separate yourself from the cat. That does not mean you have to lock the cat away, but you may have to lock yourself away while you do computer work. Do not work inside of any sort of electronics when you have a cat around. Cause and if for no other reason, because you'll have taken some screws out, the cat will go, oh, look, something to bat under the fridge. Yeah, they like doing that, too. Of course, you, the only toy this one's interested in, even a little bit, is the feather toy. You okay over there? You still indignant? You're still indignant. Okay, all right. Jeez. He did not like me picking him up. I hope you're happy. Um, so the next, uh, I think the last one we want to consider when it comes to if you're a new, and this doesn't just apply to cats. This is also one for dogs too. Wires. If you're like me, the back of your computer has a lot of things plugged into it. This is just a basic computer owner. You will have a mouse, a keyboard, a set of speakers, a power, and a monitor connector. That's a basic computer setup. Maybe you're wireless with the mouse and keyboard, okay, but you're still gonna have a bunch of wires coming off the back of your computer. And what a wire looks like to a cat, and sometimes to a dog, is a dangling wire looks like something cray. Uh, especially if, they, if they're walking around, they brush against the wire. It moves. It must have moved on its own. Ah, nah, 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 nah. Yeah. And now they generally do that with power cables. Generally. Generally. But they may do it with other expensive cables. That is an issue. Now, you have two options. One of them works slightly less. The other is probably your better bet to try and deal with this. This is the not so good option. And usually you want to wait on using this till after you've actually seen evidence of them biting on anything around the house. And I got this, he hasn't chewed on anything yet. He, he's very, he's still in the timid stage, but I got this just in case. Um, there are different brands. I bought this one, it's called Chew Fix. And part of it's green screened out, so that's neat. Um, it is a bittering agent spray. And what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to spray this on cables and other things you don't want him, your cat or your dog chewing. It says for cats, dogs, and horses. So you're covered on three fronts there, just in case. Um, the big component in this, what? Cats, dogs, and horses. And horses. Cats and dogs, okay, it's no problem. Other household pets, horses, sure. Horses, yeah. Um, the, the main ingredient here that the cats don't like is the citric acid part. Cats yeah. hate citrus for some weird reason. Lemons and all that other stuff. This sprayed on the Unless you've got a particularly weird cat. That was, yeah, I was going to get into to that. This sprayed on the cables, once they take a bite of this, of a cable one time that has this on it, they should start learning, I don't want to put my mouth on that. Unless your cat or dog is weird and they decide this is the most delicious thing ever or they just don't give a crap and they keep chewing anyway. Now, you can try to give them alternate things to chew like the rawhide chews. Those They have rawhide chews for, for cats too who just really want to chew. Um, but there is a better option and it takes a little more time on your part, but not so much money if you're willing to, to put into it. Um, I have these wonderful things I got a while back for running my uh, ethernet cable. Um, they are these simple little plastic mounts that stick on the wall. They don't, you don't have to nail anything to the wall, just peel and stick off this double-sided applicator, stick it on the wall and then run a zip tie through the loop. And what you need to do is run your cables high enough off the ground and this is the most important snugly. part. Snugly. 
So they don't dangle, they don't drift around, they don't look like something moving that's alive and edible. You move these up and away from where your pet could get at them, and yeah, it takes more time. It's not that expensive. You probably pick up a, a, a pack of, of, like, I think 12 of them for four bucks. And it mainly what it's going to take cost you is time to get the cables out of the way. Um, once, once you do that, you should keep your cables away from them. Now, any other thing in your house they may want to chew, you're on your own. I'm sorry. I can only do so much. I am not a miracle worker. So, so I think that that, that kind of covers all I wanted to. Hopefully that has helped some of you out there who have, who have got a pet newly or thinking about acquiring some new shiny technology and you already have a pet you love and you want to make things go smoothly for everybody. And you, you're asleep. You're fucking asleep. Five minutes ago you hated me, now you're fucking asleep. You, I don't know what I'm going to do with this fucking animal. Ah, so... Um, we've covered that, but I want to also, we have a little bit of news and then we'll get to questions. Um, what do we got this week? Oh, what, shall we start with Microsoft? Oh, sure. Why not? This is a late breaking story. This actually just came out yesterday. Um, uh, ours and a bunch of other people are reporting on this and it is, so I know lots of people want to keep using, uh, Windows 7 and Windows, even Windows 8 for a while, because they're still skeptical about um, Windows 10. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I know a streamer who has a Blackmagic video capture card he uses for uh, his PS4. And he bought a brand new system. His viewers chipped in for it. It was a great big thing. And he plugged it all in. And the Windows 10 driver for either his USB 3.0 for that motherboard or for black magic for the capture card wasn't working so he had to go back to screen capture until he could finally figure it out so windows 10 for those of us who rely on technology and setups we have established we're still leery of it however you may start losing that you're definitely going to lose that option in the future um the newest microsoft processor Skylake, you have 18 months to upgrade to Windows 10, and then they stop supporting older versions of Windows for security fixes. And from now on, after the um, Intel Skylake processor, um, older processors will not be supported by Windows. Interesting. Essentially, forcing upgrades. Hmm. So let's say you wait for the, um, the the next iteration of you skip Skylake and you wait for the next um, uh, Intel processor to come out, the seventh generation Intel processor, which will probably be coming about two years. But you're used to using Windows 7 and Windows 8. You want to keep using those. Too bad. Because your brand new computer will not operate with Windows 7 or 8. Because Microsoft will not be releasing drivers for Windows 7 or 8. Now, it may be somewhat compatible, but not fully compatible, which could lead to issues down the line. Lots of blue screens. Lots of fucking blue screens. This is some old bullshit. This this is is will this uh Will Jr. asked will this lead compatibility issues with the older games? If you can't get that game to work in maybe uh virtual you'd have to virtual box Windows 7 or something. If you can't get it to work in a virtual device, maybe, yeah. Microsoft, it seemed like Microsoft was going to try and do everything right with Windows 10 and then just started doing all the same wrong shit again. Especially the way Windows 10 updates work. You don't get a choice about Windows 10 updates unless you're very tech savvy and you go in and disable a whole bunch of shit. 
you don't get a choice. Windows 10 will update itself whether you want it to or not. So you're kind of stuck with whatever they do. So yeah, it's... What the fuck? What the fuck is this? I don't like this. Well, I mean, I, I also look at it like 18 months from now. You know, it's, it's a pretty, pretty big window corporate wise. You say that, but that's going to that is a very expensive thing to deal with in terms of upgrades. And I don't see where it says they're going to stop supporting the older ones that work. If they switch to Windows 10 now on the older one, you'll still be OK. Mm -hmm. But we the, a Windows 10 update come out and it would change everything. Yeah. It's possible it's not going to work, you know, 18 months from now, I'll get an update saying, oh, you've got to upgrade your processor. And that is entirely, and the fact that Microsoft is pushing everyone to lock into Windows 10, giving away for free, you want to get in this, and it's one of those, we have altered the deal, pray we do not alter it further. Well, I also see it as not wanting to pay some other people to continue to support Windows 7 and 8 and earlier. <laughs> well, maybe, but if they would, you know, stop fucking with things that made people not want Windows 10, like the privacy shit and the Windows updates and all those other things, maybe people wouldn't have, you know, wouldn't have a fucking problem with upgrading. Like me, I, I'm skeptical of upgrading because I have a Blackmagic capture card too. What if I upgrade my upgrade my streaming rig suddenly stops working? Microsoft, their their response is pretty much, oh, it's on the manufacturer. Go deal with them. It's not our problem. Don't look at us. Leave us alone. We're we're gonna make new things and you shut the fuck up with your antique shit. I bought this two years ago. It's antique shit. Fuck you. Go away. We're gonna make new shit now. And it's it's fucking frustrating. So fuck you, Microsoft. But I didn't want to be entirely fuck you tonight. This is something that happened back in December, or at least started back in December, and it's uh, it, the, the next round is coming up. We're going to talk about something really cool that's been happening in technology. Okay. One of the biggest problems with spaceflight in terms of expense is the booster rockets. Oh, yeah, getting stuff into orbit. How it used to work um, with most of the whole rockets was you shoot rocket up bye bye rocket the booster rockets on the side of the space shuttle i believe they could only ever get the big one back the ones on the little ones on the side whoo go bye bye um getting stuff into orbit you couldn't land a rocket the rocket would go away and that was all and that rocket pretty much represented money going away Millions of dollars just whee, gone away. Well, SpaceX, which is the big new uh, private contractor for NASA, which is attempting to um, update and streamline the whole process of getting stuff from here up into orbit, has worked very hard. And in December, they managed to land their first ever rocket. And... Yeah. That was back at Cape Canaveral. They're trying now, they're, they're gonna move, they're trying again uh, on the West Coast. They're preparing for another rocket landing. And um, their next big hurdle is they want to try to make a rocket land on the ocean. Platform on the ocean, or? something like that. Yeah, they're, they're going to they're going to try and take a, a a platform out into the ocean and direct the rocket to land back on that. Now they've already managed to get a rocket back down on the launch pad, which is stupendous in and of itself because we're that that's reusable rockets right there. That's a huge jump. But to be able to take the landing platform out into the ocean and get the rocket to land on a landing platform in the middle of the ocean, that's going to be phenomenal. If this becomes a more regular thing, what we're looking at is a much, much more economical means of spaceflight and that much closer to a 
commercial space setup. And until we have a uh, space elevator. We are never having a space elevator, Mike. They are. Ne we are never getting our shit together enough to build a space elevator. The, the, the whole idea of we'd have to build a ring around the planet. We'd have to all get our shit together. Enough. You know how much it bad it was trying to get us to build one international space station? And we're not building another one. We're just going to let that one crash. We ain't building no fucking space elevator. That is never happening. Uh, so, yeah, I thought that was cool. We, we, oh, yeah, it's very cool. This is a huge... And it has the advantage, if they screw up, it's, it's landed in the ocean and they haven't blown up a suburb. Well, it depends on which suburb, you know? There, there's some I wouldn't... We, I could call, you know, acceptable losses. In some case, a bonus, you know... Some suburbs we could do without a few suburbs. I'm just saying. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's fascinating. It, this is an interesting time, at least with NASA's funding decreasing and with a push for more privatization. The fact that we are making advances in spaceflight, and just recently the the uh, Congress, I know, amazingly enough, Congress is doing something. Um, Congress is trying to pass legislation that will allow people to mine some of the water they have identified on the moon. There is water on the moon. They found that. Well, why would Congress need to pass legislation saying you can mine water on the moon? Because then they have to get together with the other countries and make sure there's no fucking problems and no one's going to start a war because some private company is up there mining water on the moon. Because then China goes, wait a second, what are you doing? And Russia goes, what the fuck are you doing? And Japan goes, what the fuck are you doing? And it's a massive, so we have to pass some laws and then go talk to other countries. But steps, steps, baby steps, we're making it. Um, but yeah, I, that's, that, that's another fantastic thing. The, the, they're moving forward with that. Private companies want to mine water on the moon, which is our first step to Mars. We have water on the moon. We have a refueling station. Refueling station. Boom. We Mars. I love this shit. It's it's a lot. And why are you going, well, why can't we take water from Earth? Because it takes a whole lot more rocket fuel to get water off of Earth than it does to get rocket off, to get water off of the moon. It's gravity thing. It's oh yeah, yeah, it's gravity well. So it's much easier to just load the fuck up off water off the moon than it is to load it up off Earth. It's a gravity thing. Gravity. Ain't just theory no more. All right. So, taking care of all of that. So now uh, it's time to start answering some questions. And boy, howdy, we got a lot since last time. Um, now, if we miss your question, I apologize. Um, we, have, we do have a lot. I will try to get to the next round as best we can, because we, we got a lot. I, that's good. I like getting a lot of questions. Just means we can't answer everybody's questions. But I will try. We will try. Um, by the way, if you have a tech question you would like for us to attempt to answer, send it to requestradiodeadair.com. Put tech Q&A in the subject line. We will attempt to do what we can for you. First one comes to us. Let's start off with an easy one here. Uh, Gelly Elfson sent us um i have been thinking of getting a new cell phone did you give a recommendation or two the only exception is iphones no offense to apple but i'll pass well you know as much shit as i give apple over a lot of their decisions they do make a damn good phone the iphone is an exceptional piece of kit is it worth however much you fucking spend on it that's debatable, but it is a damn good phone. However, if you are Apple averse and you don't, you really don't want to be part of the Apple ecosystem. Um, honestly, I would say, you know, the, the for the money for what you get for it, I would go with a Google Nexus. Yeah, 
or a, a Samsung Galaxy Note. I've had a lot of luck with those. Yeah, my well, I lean more toward the Nexus for one specific reason, and that is updates. Sure. With Google, you're getting the updates pretty directly. You're not going through, you know, the lead time of Samsung going, oh, we've got this update. We've got to verify it. We've got to put our own spin on it. We've got to do this and that and the other thing to it. Yeah. Um, it's it. The biggest problem right now with, with Android phones is the manufacturers and the carriers. The manufacturers get a copy of Android from Google and they go, we need to put our branding and our special shit all over this. So they shit all over it. Then the carriers look at it and go, hmm, we need to put our branding and our special shit all over this. So they shit all over it. So the time Google releases an Android update and the time it actually gets to your phone could be upwards of years. There have been some Android updates that have taken years to reach customers. I think, really, I think what Google should start doing is when it, you know, it's time to re-sign contracts with people, say, yes, you may continue to use Android or whatever. They should put in a clause saying how quickly they must push out the patches. Now, the reason I recommend the Google Nexus phone is these are specially designed and they have agreements with carriers and the people who make the Google Nexus phones that the updates come directly from Google. The carriers don't get in the way. The manufacturers don't get in the way. You get Android updates as they get released, just like the iPhone, which is one of the advantages of the iPhone. You get security updates like that. That wasn't for you. <laughs> Everything I do is just scares the fuck out of him. Everything, every little, every time I stand up, he acts like the world is ending. Um, anyway, as I was saying, if you are opposed to Apple, a Google Nexus phone, they, they are tend to be high quality. They tend to be Google's flagship phones at the time. I, my Google Nexus is, I think this is a 2013 Google Nexus. It's still a perfectly functional phone. Um, this is the LG Nexus they had. Um, I bought it off contract. I think the current one is like $400, which is a bit steep, but still cheaper than iPhone. And you buy it off contract, you own it. Um, it's a phone that you can take just about anywhere in the world. I've had no problem. I just had to sw swap SIM cards and it still works. Um, so yeah, I would recommend one of those if Apple is not fewer like it. That, that's your best recommendation, um, for that. Uh, let's see. Move, do you have anything else to add, Mike? Um, I would suggest also, you know, with whatever you're getting, possibly if you're, if you're budget conscious, looking one release back or finding out what their release date for their next series of phones is, so you go, so if, for example, you're looking at the train, uh, Samsung Galaxy Nexus, or Galaxy uh, Note, sorry. If you're looking at the Note, you go, okay, the Note, whatever is out now, the Note 5 is out now. When's the Note 6 coming out? I know it's a really long train. Note 6 comes out in September. And the month before that, you're going to see massive deals on the yeah. Note 5. So that's one thing to look at. You know, if, if if something meets all your requirements, for example, when I got mine, it's Note 3. I got mine right when the Note 4 was coming out, and I looked at the difference between the two, and it was like, there's nothing here I need. So we, I got a $400 phone for $99. We've hit a saturation point in the smartphone market where they keep adding features, which are neat features, but the software really doesn't need it yet. All the functions of the phone, it doesn't really add to your phone experience that much. Maybe your apps are a wee bit faster, but it's hard to tell distinctly. So in, in, in this case, the processor wasn't really any faster. And the only, the only real difference is slightly faster yeah. processor, slightly better cam. That yeah. was the difference. So, like, so being about a generation back on a phone isn't going to affect you at all. So that is a good thing to help. Um... Let's see. Okay, this is a little bit of a long and I'll try and condense it a little bit. This comes to us from EGC. That's all we got on that one. EGC. Sounds like okay. some sort of shady corporation from an old episode of Swamp Thing or something. EGC. Um, I'm currently consolidating what would be my first PC build. 
and my main work fun computer? I have two questions, but only the first I'd say is more problem. All right. Um, first off, he asks us uh, about he's going to be using the computer to encode music and some games and programming projects. He's asking about the type of drive to get. Um, the difference between Western Digital and Seagate. Now, Western Digital offers three, currently, three types of drives. Blue, black, and green. Now, as a, per, as a normal person, does telling you it is a Western Digital black, blue, or green give you any fucking clue about what that means in terms of a hard drive? Uh, I would think that the green one would have energy saving capabilities and that's about the only thing i could guess off of those colors close yeah well the the uh the, the western digital green is a little less and not very much but it consumes a little less electricity which they call it. this is our green option the reason it consumes a little bit of electricity is it's slower than the other drives it spins a little bit slower what a green and i, I want to say it had some energy saving option that if you read the reviews online everyone hates that energy saving option yeah what it does what it's what the green is designed to do is it's a storage drive basically you get a western digital green drive you do not put an operating system on that drive it will not be fast it will not be responsive what the green drive is made to do is you can put data on there. Stuff that like a, a video file or um, a music file or something like that, that doesn't need a time-based reaction to, to work with. It, it, it's, it's not time sensitive. So you can, you can do that. Blue is Western Digital's um, regular old desktop hard drive. It's at a moderate speed. It's useful for just about everyday tasks. You can run an operating system off of it. It's not the fastest, but it works. Black is really, really fast, at least in terms of a hard drive. It's not an SSD. It's not a solid state drive, but it's still a hard drive. Black is the fastest one they offer. It's a little bit more noticeably quicker than the blue, but not much and not nearly as fast as a solid state drive and that's it i've never seen the black drives be worth the cost difference between the blue drives honestly because if you're going to be paying more for a hard drive anyway you should just go ahead and get a solid state drive than just pay for a faster old type hard drive so if uh you're getting this drive um for a storage drive, you can get the green. If you're getting it for storage and your operating system, get a blue, maybe a black. I wouldn't bother with Seagate so much. I haven't, the Barracuda is, is Seagate's Barracudas. The reviews go back and forth and Seagate's have had some issues over the years. Yeah, I, I think it boils down to where it was built, whether it was built in, uh, I forget where their, their, their factories, but they have basically two large factories. Taiwan oh. and... I want to say Thailand. I want to say Thailand, yeah. Yeah, something like that. I want to say if it was built in Taiwan, it was better than the ones built in Thailand. But they started shifting more and more of their stuff out of Taiwan because it was too expensive to build there anymore. Yeah. The other question is about the chipset for the motherboard he wants to get. The difference between the AMD 970 chipset and the 990FX. Everyone at home is going, what the fuck is a chipset? It's what runs the computer. What's yeah. what, what makes the computer a computer? Yeah, there's uh, your motherboard has a little processor built into it. That's not the one for the computer. It's just one to manage all the parts in your computer. And some of them can do more than others. Some of them can do extended features. Some of them have really nice audio built into it. The other little features like that. In this case, the, the main difference between the AMD 970 and the 990FX is the 990FX supports SLI and Crossfire. SLI and Crossfire, in case you don't know, it's when if you want really powerful video on your computer, instead of one video card, you plug in two of the exact same video card into your system you put a little connector on the two of them and they work together and they all and they go faster. More video card, more faster. Um, so that's SLI. If that's an important feature, something to consider. 
The other thing is the 990 offers, uh, the 990 FX offers some more overclocking options that the 970 doesn't. Yeah, but he also said that didn't seem to be an issue for him. He didn't care about overclocking. Yeah, if you're not going to be overclocking your computer, if it, it, all right, if you don't know what overclocking is, you're not going to be overclocking your computer. I can pretty much say that right now. If you don't know what it is, you ain't probably ain't going to do it. So the 970 will do you just fine. There you go. That's that's it. So, and I uh, of the of the brand names, I I would go with MSI. I've had a lot of luck with them on components. I've had it. He he said, talked about issues with Gigabyte lately. I'm still using. I've, had, I've used Gigabyte boards for years, but some of them may have issues. Some of them may not. Yeah, I mean, my motherboard is a Gigabyte, but I have MSI equipment elsewhere and an MSI laptop. But so it's a good solid company. And Gigabyte used to be, so if they've got issues now, it's probably quality control at a, a single factory. Yeah. Our next one comes from ET. Oh, no. Something like that. Yes, yeah, just, just ET. Okay. Um, he writes, I might be a bit paranoid, but I was wondering if there's any steps a person can take for securing their accounts past secure different passwords and two-factor authentication. I saw on Twitter some script kitties hacked Markiplier's YouTube channel, along with asking people who else they should hack and releasing some of his personal information. To my understanding, which isn't that advanced, to do all that would mean there's a way around two-factor authentication. Uh, depends. Okay, so two-factor authentication, for people uh, not aware, is where you've got two items that you use to identify yourself where you can log in. And this is usually described as something you know and something you are. Uh, it can be other ways. For example, a password is one factor and a biometric signal could be a second. So it's, it's very thumbprint. hard in, in theory for someone to spoof your thumbprint or your uh, retina print, you know, eyeball print or things like that. In practice, not necessarily be hard because of how th some of these things are implemented. If they're implemented poorly, you're going to have issues. Uh, another type of two-factor is password and PIN. So you've got two different things you have to supply, one of which comes possibly from a secure device, whether it's a, a dongle or an app on your phone, which you have to load up and go, aha. And that app on your phone was authenticated separately at some point saying, I am this person tied to this account. This app only works in this phone. So someone else tries to load the app on the phone. They get a completely different number. They try to say, I'm this person. They've got to provide a different set of identifying information. Two-factor is generally, generally, if it's implemented properly, hard to get around. Now, you say, Script Kitty's hacked uh, Markiplier's YouTube channel. Uh, to your understanding, that means there's a way around two-factor. Not necessarily. It means he may not have been using two-factor. Or he may have... Th th this is, I was just talking about Alice. Or, or, or they hacked into something where his second factor was so they could get that information. I was talking to Allison about this the other day. And the, the whole new CSI cyber kind of spark. Have you seen that show? Oh, that is uh, cringe. I, I watch it religiously. Not be, I, enjoy, I enjoy aspects of it, but I also watch it to specifically go, that is wrong. That is wrong. You were doing that tech wrong. They hacked a, they hacked a plane and flew it around from the in-flight entertainment. No. No, no. Um, um, depending on how they set up, you could, in theory, if it was set up, okay, so in theory, possible in the same way that Target's credit card systems were hacked from their HVAC. If everything is on the same network, then you might be able to get from one to the other, but whether or not you could actually control any signals from one end to the other is a different matter. But the, the point I was making is real hacking is more, a lot more like Mr. Robot. If you've watched that show, that's a fantastic show for showing you what hacking's like. Because the biggest weakness in any system... People. People. Social engineering is what it's called. It's the uh, easiest... It's, it's the most direct route to hacking someone's account. You'll notice on, your, on uh, a lot of sites, they'll give you your password question which is, what's your mother's maiden name? What's the street you grew up on? What was the uh, first uh, elementary school you went to? What was your first car? What was your first pet's name? 
all a dedicated hacker has to do, if you're very much open and not even thinking about it, is go look on your Facebook page, scroll back a few years, they'll find all the information they need to pretend to be you and get into your account. That's what happens a lot of the time. Also, even with two-factor authentication, a system is only as good as the people operating it. So if there is a hole on, say you have two-factor authentication with Twitter or Tumblr or YouTube or something, if there's a hole on Twitter side or Tumblr side or any of those, it doesn't matter how good your authentication is. If they have access to that, they can do an end run around. So nothing, this is some advice I've got to tell you. Nothing you do online, nothing is secure. Everything you do online is a risk reward uh, ratio proposition. That's, that, that's everything. Post, sending an email, posting on Twitter, posting on Facebook, everything is risk reward. And you may think there's very little risk in doing something, and the problem there might be. No one might care about it. But nothing online is truly secure. You should be aware of that. You can take steps to make yourself more secure, but you will never be completely secure online. So, yeah. Um, I'm trying to do a quick search because I really don't know who Markiplier was. You don't know Markiplier? No, I don't really. Oh, he's awesome. But I'm trying to I see. Like Markiplier. No information, I, 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 no reliable information I've found here that said how he got actually hacked. And as this only happened a couple days ago, I don't expect there to be real information on how it happened for at least another week. He's a cool dude. I like Mark Blair. He's funny. Um, all right, let's see. Next up, Jared writes us asking, my present laptop, a Toshiba satellite C50B, has a limited number of USB ports. Um, I... Uh, I have a USB hub, but I don't recall it being very good, mostly because I didn't pay much for it, so quality likely suffered. Any suggestions for a USB hub uh, that could even just branch between two hard drives connected to it? Well, I looked up your, uh, Jared, I looked up your laptop, the Toshiba Satellite C50B series, and you're in luck. It has a USB 3.0 port on it. Now, while there may be some glitchy stuff with USB 3.0, one of the really good things it did was increase the amount of power available to peripherals through the USB 3.0 slot. So you can use USB 2.0 devices through it and still be able to get a reliable amount of power from the USB 3.0 port to, say, your portable hard drives or whatnot without causing any trouble. As to which model, Oh, there are so many. There are so, so many. Um, my best recommendation on this, I bought one uh, a while back and I paid 10 bucks for it on Amazon. What I did was I looked for top reviewed ones. I read reviews. I did a little homework to see if anyone had any problems with them, if they functioned well. And once I found one that looked good, that's the one I got. Simple as that. Yeah, and there's plenty of manufacturers out there making them. I mean, uh, honestly, the easiest way to do this is go to U uh, U U Newegg, uh, type in USB hub, and then put 3.0 because you can select that later down on the yeah, filters. Yeah. And if you try to put it elsewhere, it will might mess up. Uh, and then just click on the one that says, you know, uh, user reviews five eggs. Yeah. If you go with the top reviewed stuff, you're not going, you might pay a few extra dollars, but you're not necessarily going to go too far wrong and the, 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 they're normally the ten dollar range will get you something that'll work just fine so i wouldn't worry too much about it yeah just if you're concerned about power output a 3.0 is a good way to go because it does deliver more power to peripherals yeah and there there are ten dollar options and there's things all up to 40 or 50 dollar options um whether or not you need some of the bells and whistles that come with those $50 options, 
Um, I don't know. Um, I see a $50 one out here that, you know, it's a USB 3 hub that says it can provide both USB 3 power to everything plugged into it, which could be very useful. Yeah. Um, all right, we've got uh, two more. Oh, these are going to take a little while. Okay. Oh, this one. Another one of those little fiddly fucking, I hate the fiddly fucking problems. It's from Keir Healy. He writes, uh, I Keir, is it Keir, is that a he or a she? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, anyway, I have two problems that are both related to Windows 10. Uh, since I upgraded, I have two persistent problems. First, a couple of times today, my internet goes to limited internet or searching for an IP address. Normally, restarting my Ethernet adapter or router will sort this out, but it's very annoying. Huh. What could be cause... Oh, get off the screen. Get off, get off of Mike's face. I have things on your face, Mike. I'm sorry. And uh, I'm seeing that's a male name. Yeah, okay, it's a male name. Um, what could be causing that? Oh, boy. All right. The first thing you want to do is eliminate your router as potentially causing the problem. I doubt it's your router since it only happens since you upgraded. But let's just, for the sake of argument, eliminate the router from the issue. Um, what you want to do is power off your computer, power off your router, power off your modem, be it a DSL or um, uh, cable. Now, if you have one of those combo routers and modems and routers like we told you not to use, there's not a lot we can do here. Yeah. But if they are separate, um, disconnect the uh, um, Ethernet cable from the back of the router that plugs into the modem. Okay, disconnect the one that goes from your computer to the router. Take the one that goes that normally goes to the router from the computer and plug that directly into the modem. Power up the modem, then power up your computer. Test it for an hour or so and see if your internet connection is more stable, if it doesn't do that disconnecting thing. If it doesn't, congratulations, your router's host. That's not really a congratulations, but you found the problem, which is the important part. Um, if it does go off, then we're back to headaches. And the next likely culprit is um, drivers. Since Windows 10 is so new, um, you may require a newer driver. And Windows 10 may not have, uh, the, the one that's automatically from Windows 10 may not be the newest driver. What you'll have to do. So, oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. We check your driver manufacturer, uh, your, your your Ethernet manufacturer, uh, and see if they have an updated driver for Windows 10. Uh, see if there's a generic driver for Windows 10 for that chipset if you mm -hmm. want to get down to the chipset level. That's that's newer. Uh, if neither of those are the case and it, it's an old enough device, I'm assuming separate. Assuming, of course, that it's a separate Ethernet card on the computer, not built in Ethernet card. Hmm. Built in Ethernet. If it's built in Ethernet, you're sort of out of luck. Well, um, you can bypass it, but it's you can pain bypass. To buy you it. can buy an extra Ethernet card and plug that in and, and go to town. Just buy some of the latest yeah. space. We'll say Windows 10 on the box, hopefully you know, supported, uh, and go from there. Uh, updated driver will probably do it if it's not the uh, the router. Yeah. If it is the router, by the way, check to see if there's a router firmware update. That can do it too. Yeah, some uh, routers are computers too. That's something people don't take into account. Routers are their own little computers, and sometimes they may need to talk to Windows different. It's rare. It's incredibly rare, but it's possible. And there have been, uh, I want to say, a handful of router updates that sort of made the news on sites like Ars Technica saying, "Hey, they put out this update because uh, they found something bad." Uh, and it could be it's just that and it's Microsoft's end is going, oh, this is bad. I we're trying to work around. Okay, slow things down. And once you get things up to a certain spec level, it'll be fine again. Um, Here's the second part of your question. Yeah, this one is. I had to do some research on this one. Second problem is sometimes when I shut down my computer, it'll restart instead. I know this isn't just me misclicking because it's happened too often for it to be that. It only happens with the start menu, and only when I shut down from the lock when I shut down from the lock screen, it always works. 
I think I have a solution to this. I had th this is this is this will take a minute for you to do, but this will probably solve the problem. Right, follow me here. This is what coming from likely a USB issue with Windows 10 because of the upgrade. There is a fix for it. What you want to do, turn the computer off, disconnect every USB device except for your keyboard and mouse. Turn the computer back on go through the normal startup routine and everything, then shut once it's all started up and set up, shut it down again. Now plug all your USB devices back in and start the computer. Real quick question in that. Uh -huh. Plug them back into the same ports they were in before or plug them into just randomize them? Same, it, you can put them same before or randomize, it doesn't really matter. Only reason I ask is because sometimes when you're plugging USB, to, if you plug a USB device from one port to another, it goes, I need to reload the drivers. That 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 may help, honestly, but yeah. it's just letting them, letting them know in case there's in case it goes. Well, why the hell is it doing this? And regardless, what this is should do. What's happening is there's it's it's really fucking complicated. But there's a glitch in Windows 10 because you upgraded. Um, that is seeing the USB device the way it used to be and not the way it is. I know I this is not accurate. I'm just very generalizing. And what you're doing when you disconnect, when you shut the computer down, unplug all your USB devices, turn the computer back on, start it up, turn it back off, and then plug them back in, is you are telling the computer to look at the USB devices all over again and set them up how they are now with Windows 10. Because what you were doing before, when it was shutting down, it was causing a hang because it was confused by the USB devices. It was like, what are these? Where these come from i don't like you anymore i think we should see other people what you're doing is some relationship therapy for your usb devices <laughs> essentially I, I i'm losing my analogies here i'm just doing my best this will this is the best solution i come up for for your problem because i've seen a lot of other people have talked about it too hopefully this will fix it for you um we're running out of time we got one more to do Ooh, this is a bit of a doozy Oh, all with the two-part questions. Why is it always the two-part questions? All right, this one comes from Jay. Hello, Jay. Hello, Jay. Uh, I have a two-part question. I'm taking some game development courses, got a new laptop, and lists all the shit, and it's all shiny and ooh, and neat. First question, what would be the best way to transfer the OS onto the SSD and format the hard drive into a storage drive? I did this exact same thing with my laptop, by the way. Um, the best way to do this. Now, you mentioned Samsung has software that does this. That's okay, but I've known it's been a little hit and miss. There, I just had to do this for Allison's computer because uh, she had a hard drive dying, her main drive, and she got an SSD. So what we did was, what you want to do is not a backup, because you list on here that you do backups on your system all the time, and that's good. That, that, that's good for a system you have established. But backups are not exact partition duplication. They just, they're just they just taking a bunch of your information, putting it to a zip file and putting it away so that you can get it back. Partitions and boot tables are a little more complicated, and that's why there exists something called a clone. Uh, what it does is it looks at the hard drive. It makes an exact duplicate of that drive. And you can move the drive, that duplicate, to a different drive entirely. Um, I recommend, because I just used this software, and best part, it's free. Um, it's called Paragon Backup and Recovery 14. It's their free edition. What you'll have to do, download this, install it, read the instructions. I have to tell you that I, I really don't have time to get into all the instructions here, but they're not complicated. You can follow the directions on this. Um, make a, a complete backup, a clone of your existing partitions, not just data files. You want to clone the partitions. You're going to need a separate drive to hold this information on that's at least as big as the drive you have right now. So just fair warning. 
Uh, so get a portable uh, hard drive temporarily to copy all this stuff onto. Then you uh, make a uh, bootable uh, USB stick. They have it's called their Recovery Media Builder. It's 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 easy as as can be. Boot your laptop off that. Make sure you have the new drive plugged in, and run the the restore to the brand new drive, you're essentially going to be making a duplicate of your old drive to the new drive. And the best part is the software is free for personal use. So, boom. Let's see. His other concern is keeping the system cool once he starts using it. Always report repeatedly. The program game caused the graphics card to heat up a lot. Okay. Your best way to work to keep your laptop cool. Proper ventilation. Don't use the laptop, and, and this is a this is a, this sounds like complete madness to say it. One of the easiest ways to overheat your laptop is using your laptop in bed. Mike, you're just kind of looking at me like what? No, 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 absolutely agree. Yeah, because using your laptop in bed, what you're doing is you set it down. It's on a fabric surface that blocks the intake vents. Laptops, if you look at the bottom, they have very small feet. Not very big ones, but they have little nubs. They have little little yeah. feet things. You're not, you're not talking a lot of height here. So when it sinks into the, the, uh, the, the, the duvet or the blanket or the sheet or whatever you have on your bed, and the mattress pad sinks down in there, it's like, I can't get any air in. And you, you mentioned this here. You had, it on, you had your previous one on a stack of paper. Mm -hmm. uh, and probably, you know, folded papers and crinkled papers and things like that blocking the vents yeah uh, now there is a look they do make a kind of a solution for this it's kind of a laptop stand um you can look on amazon and find a couple of these that will lift your laptop up enough to keep airflow going underneath it and it's recommended if you're going to use it in bed or something but even the basic laptop it's designed those little feet things the design that when you put it on a desk it has enough of a gap to let the air get in and vent, you know, proper air cooling for your laptop. That's the thing you have to remember the most. Do not block the air intake on your laptop and it'll work fine. So either keep it on a flat surface the way it's intended to be used, or if you're going to use it elsewhere, get a little bit, of, get one of those little uh, portable riser stands. They're not that expensive and it will save your laptop. And some of them have built in cooling as well. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I never trust those. Yeah, yeah. I, I never. Just saying, if, if you wanted, you know, it's a, more of an old, you know, realistically, if you had a breakfast in bed tray, you could put it on that and that would work. Yeah, just make that's sure. That's all it is. Yeah. So, yeah, that that that's that's your best bet there. So, well, whew, that should cover everything for this week. Hopefully we were helpful for you peoples out there. I hope. It's kind of why we do this. More or less. I'm tempted to put the kitty back on the air, but I don't want to piss him off. I don't want to scare him. He's only... You could try, you could try to trick the kitty up on the stand. No, that's... Not, he, he's not a climber. He's... It's... I think he's... I think my damn cat's afraid of heights. <laughs> I'm not kidding. So, you okay over there, Grady? I'll only... Okay, I'll, I'll leave it till Monday and only... If you want to see him again, you'll have to see it on Monday. He'll have, we'll put him up on it briefly on RDA. May I make a suggestion? Yeah. Do you have a second camera? No, but maybe I should set one up. That would be neat. Second camera, put it down at ground level and let's call it kitty cam. We could do that. We could do that. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll worry about that. Yeah, you know, well, maybe we'll do that on Monday. How about that? Or Gary? alternate and additional option, a very small, lightweight wireless camera that you can clip to his collar. And you've got kitty roaming kitty cam. That's yeah, that, that that's that's a little that's a little too much, Mike. A little too much. A little too much.